<laughs> Trina Ferguson is currently writing her memoir to be self-published by Balboa Press within 12 months. That's not long. <laughs> Expressing her passion for life as well as her struggle with bipolar, Book will open the doors to questions about spirituality and the role it plays in a mental health breakthrough to the other side. Her hours and hours of writing poetry, short stories, and philosophical journaling have allowed her to comfortably take the stage at open mics across the city for the past 12 years. While the first few years were both exhilarating and terrifying, both as a writer and a mental health consumer, she's now looking forward to a future of helping others with her story of courage. Along the way, she has found great comfort in friends, family, bike riding, and her business as a dog walker in the Main Street area where she resides. She currently volunteers for ONE, an international charity that lobbies governments worldwide for change in the poorest countries of Africa affected by AIDS, TB, malaria, as well as extreme poverty. In June, Trina placed third in the event Story Slam and has been published in both Common Ground Magazine and the Pulse Magazine. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to read from my uh, draft two, second draft of my memoir. Um, just going to jump right in. I'll give you two sections of it. Chapter one. Agitated, the cab driver swerves, turning a corner, narrowly missing someone staggering across the road. It's not their fault, I say. They can't help it. Clearly, he does not want to be racing to the downtown east side of Vancouver. It's dark with shadows distorting the once tall and proud buildings lining the street. Little did I know how much my life would dramatically change by the unraveling mystery that occurred that night. Directing him to stop at the old abandoned Woodward's department store, I thrust into his hands. I thrust money into his hands. His face shows concern with lines like that of a caring father. Waving away his doubts about my destination, I have no fear. I'm on a mission. Blue tarts and signs of protest litter the walls around the east side of the building. The homeless protest has been going on for about a month. Strewn upon the sidewalk are bodies in varied states of both sleep and wakefulness. It is around midnight in the cool October air of 2002. I'm running for mayor of Vancouver, I state, with a smile of encouragement to them. A few people mumble inaudibly. Music is being played over a portable ghetto blaster on the site. A beautiful homeless man stands up and comes over to me. Bob Gelboff came down here, you know. He knows about your protest, I say. That must mean something to someone. I'd just seen him in a concert a few days back and had met him backstage. You know, from Live Aid, the big concerts in the 80s, and the lead singer of the Boomtown Rats. What about Paul McCartney, Wingspan? That was Paul's greatest hit CD. The man's hands then spread into wings, mimicking the album artwork. I agree with him, marrying a much younger woman since his wife died a few years back. My mother died, and then my dad remarried. She's dead, 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 I holler. I accept the homeless man as my eyes fill with tears. Expressing that he is my equal is vital to me. I stare deep into his eyes. They are pools of enlightenment. Suddenly, I see the inhumanity of leaving these people on the sidewalk like unwanted trash. They are our brothers and sisters. An epiphany grabs me by the throat. Each person on the planet is connected. This man is no different than the starving child in Africa or the millionaire CEO. We're all made up of an energy that connects us heart to heart, soul to soul. What have we done to each other? How can we treat each other so horrifically brutal? I'm aghast at the way this destitute group wants something so simple as housing and they can't get it. They are forgotten, neglected in the night. I felt so close to him after seeing the spirit in his eyes, true brotherhood. I thought my heart was going to burst. I'm running for mayor, I could help you. People begin to murmur at the commotion I'm causing. I try to dance with the homeless man, but he keeps me at arm's length. The inhumanity of his suffering is too much for me. Or is it my suffering? Sing, sing, sing. I try to squeak out as I sway back and forth with the homeless man. It's a band named Travis, and that is my favorite song. I can't give you the CD as I really need it to survive right now. I say with a tremble in my voice. Wandering into the street, I begin to cry, heaving. 
I wept openly, unashamed, surrounded and lifted up by the love in my heart. Someone asked me what was wrong, and I said, there are people sleeping on the sidewalk and you're asking me what's wrong? I couldn't contain the pain, exhaustion, and sadness I felt for the inhumanity of the world, not to mention my own detriment physically and emotionally. Someone said, oh, she's an angel. It became very quiet. Get out of the street, someone else said. You're gonna get hit by a car. Making my way back to the sidewalk, I sunk down to my knees, still gently weeping. Spending half an hour there, I later made my way to the makeshift kitchen. I don't see Larry Campbell down here. He was another candidate running for mayor. We all laughed as I bought a scone from them and gave them whatever money was left in my pocket. Some of us are being beaten up just for being homeless, horrified. I'd never heard of such a thing. Our most vulnerable citizens are being attacked for being themselves. I was quite alarmed having lived a very sheltered life. These people were our kin. How could we treat them so badly? Tonight's ideas were perplexing me beyond my breaking point. I can help, man said as he popped up out of nowhere. I have a photocopier to give to the Pivot Legal Society, an organization that helps disenfranchised and low-income people. They happen to be across the street from the protest. This would help with the case of the homeless standing up for their rights. I'll help you with that tomorrow, I said. Flagging a cab, my exhausted body was brought back to the home I was currently house sitting in. My client's dog was happy to see me, though my heart was still pounding from the adventure into the night. I settled into a quick sleep. The next day, everything felt contrived and strange. Wherever I went, people seemed to know who I was. Not only was I tired from being up all night, I still had to deliver a photocopier to the Pivot Legal Society after work. Hello, whoever you are, somebody said to me across the street. Cars honked their horns and the passengers waved out their windows to me. A cashier bowed in prayer when I came up to his till. For some strange reason, I was being revered. I couldn't understand what was going on. Strangers stopped me in the street and engaged in conversation while I proceeded to work at my dog walking business that day. They were treating me as though I was some kind of celebrity. What happened last night? Why the sudden change in treatment? It was the first time this had ever happened, but not the last time. My mental health was faltering. Making my way down to the address I was given the night before, I knocked on the apartment door. I wasn't prepared and had no way of bringing the photocopy machine to the Pivot Legal Society as it was very heavy and I also didn't have a truck. Exasperated, I made my way to the society anyways and collapsed into a chair. I'm so tired, I can't do this. They love her, the secretary exclaimed, eyeing me as she smiled into the phone. Was she talking about me? Why? Confused, I left the Pivot Legal Society and walked up the hill. I ran into Brian Salmi, leader of the Rhino Party, who was also running for mayor. He had done some events with the Rhinos in previous years when my friend Carrie ran as Dr. Evil, the villain in a Mike Myers movie, Austin Powers, in the mayor's race for Vancouver. Brian, hi! I cried out, falling into his arms. Hey, Trina, whoa! He gave me a big hug. Brian and I walked to his office at Terminal City Newspaper. It was there that I found the man who had approached me about the photocopier. We were married last night, don't you remember? He wasn't making any sense. I left the office and got on the bus to Larry Campbell's campaign office, the front runner in the mayor's race. I felt I needed to see him as he was also running for mayor. We had, we had previously said that we would vote for each other. As I mentioned, it was kind of selfish to vote for yourself. Trina, you're interrupting an important interview. Oh, sorry, Larry. I butted my way past his officials to try and get his attention. Afterwards, I made my way to the fire hall as I couldn't find my keys and I thought that maybe I, they could break into the house I was house sitting. Sorry, we can't just do that for you. You will have to find another way to get into your home. They laughed and wished me good luck, but also exchanged wary glances. Visiting a neighbor's, I was able to get a spare key when I got back to my house sitting gig. I deflated into a chair. I was at my limit's end and I was spent. What a day. I thought running for mayor was going to save my community, when in fact I was just trying to save myself. And this is the introduction um, that I'm going to start the book with. Just a little taste. 
Sitting up alert, I began to scribble in my hospital bed. The sheets were white, crisp, encapsulating me in the glass enclosed room in emergency. Time had no meaning to me. I could have been there for an hour or a week. I thought Bono was behind the wall giving a concert to thousands. He would introduce me later. Too much pain, too much pain, too much pain. It seemed to me that the line notebook needed to be filled on each page with these large words in order for me to be free from the delusions in my mind. Once the notebook is filled, I rush from my glass wall room to the nurse's station and show the emergency room nurses and doctors. Here you go, look what I did. I'm thrilled with the finished project, a book filled with the words, too much pain. Go back to your room, Trina. Giving my prize to them, I was satisfied. I had done what I was supposed to do in order to relieve my suffering. Okay. I return to my room and I lie on my back on the bed. I am aware that I'm speaking a non-stop verbal sermon. My body is heated, filling up with something so big, so grand, and my words are becoming more fevered. God is beautiful. I can't stop shaking. I see a huge white light filtering from the ceiling into my trembling body. It feels like a flow of electricity is coming from above, igniting my soul with the most exquisite touch. It is exhilarating, the purest rapture I have ever felt. This wave of love washes over me again and again, and sweat is covering the entire length of my body as it shakes uncontrollably. I'm in ecstasy. That is the only way I can explain this touch of the divine. To this day, I do not understand it. I just felt the biggest kind of love I've ever felt in my life. The love of spirit was coming to me now. The universe laid bare when I needed it most. The rapture, the parent, the all-encompassing hug of warmth filled me up in my moment of despair. Am I the second coming? Is Jesus coming for me? I could barely see the orange gloves. Oh, that's, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's not it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going. Sorry. <laughs> what is happening to me? My voice is pitched, delivering a sermon that none are going to hear. Love is the answer I'm seeking. Love is what we need. That's it. It's so simple. I'm consumed with love for those around me as the light fades from my room. I leap out of my bed and begin to go to the other patients in emergency. You are loved so much, I say to them. God loves you. We are loved. It seems so simple to me that if these patients just knew about this endless love that was at our disposal that we ourselves were made up of, they would be cured. Trina, go back to your room, please. The nurses keep saying to me. I happily oblige, but the mission I was on could not be stopped. My job was not finished, for the aching patients were still feeling pain. We are all loved by God, I stated, demoning people in the throes of their own agony. Clearly, the message was not getting through. Trina, please, go back to your bed. Don't bother the other patients, they said, getting alarmed now. The staff then called security. Four hefty men came into my room and fastened me down to the bed. Taking each hand, they secured both arms down and both legs down. Though I did not resist, I felt afraid for a moment, thinking this would leave me vulnerable to rape. There was a smirking police officer at the end of the bed. I felt threatened by him. They have left. They restrained me, but I still feel such a euphoria that I don't mind. My musical melody of words is still coming from my mouth. Someone should be documenting this. The union of pure white love that I still feel the effects of today is intoxicating, and I'm in need of its comfort.